Earlier this week, as part of its escalating trade war with the US, China announced new restrictions on the export of 12 rare earth elements. These new restrictions, which are due to take effect on December 1st, would essentially require companies producing anything made up of even just 0.1% of these elements to detail their entire supply chains and obtain a specific export license from the CCP. It's hard to overstate how burdensome this would be. Millions of products, including most modern technology, contains trace amounts of rare earths, and China's market dominance in rare earths means there aren't really any other suppliers available. So in this video, we're going to explain how China came to dominate the rare earths industry, why this has caused so much consternation in the US and Europe, and whether there's anything they can do about it. So before we get into the geopolitics of all this, what actually are rare earth elements? Well, chemists use the term to refer to a set of 17 metallic elements, the 15 lanthanides plus yttrium and scandium, which have similar chemical properties. Rare earth elements are often separated into light and heavy. The light elements are those with an atomic number lower than 65, while the heavy ones are those with an atomic number of 65 or over. In other words, everything to the right of terbium. Contrary to their name, rare earth elements aren't actually that rare. Estimates vary, but most scientists put the combined abundance of rare earth elements in the Earth's crust somewhere between 150 and 220 parts per million. Individually, the most abundant rare earth is cerium, which comes in at about 60 parts per million, while the rarest is probably thulium, which comes in at about 0.5 parts per million. For context, this is more than many other metals which are mined on an industrial scale, like copper, which comes in at about 55 parts per million. The issue is that, unlike other commercial metals, rare earth elements are rarely concentrated into easily mineable deposits. Instead, they're generally found mixed into certain clay and rock deposits, and extracting them is difficult, chemically intensive, and incredibly polluting. Neodymium, for instance, which is used to create super-strong magnets, is perhaps the most polluting metal to mine and process in the world. Fortunately, rare earths aren't required in massive quantities. Global rare earth production only amounted to about 400,000 tonnes in 2024, less than 2% of total copper output. This is because rare earths aren't that useful on their own. Rather, they're generally combined with other materials into an alloy. Sky News' Ed Conway describes them as metallurgical spices, while the Chinese sometimes call them industrial MSG. You add them in small quantities to other metals for extraordinary effect. The main direct use for rare earths are magnets and catalysts, which respectively account for 29% and 20% of all use. But this disguises quite how ubiquitous they are today. In fact, they're in so many things, it's hard to know quite how dependent we actually are on them. They're especially important for high-end technology, including semiconductors and military tech. A single F-35, for instance, requires nearly 500 kilograms of rare earth elements. Anyway, China absolutely dominates across the entire rare earth supply chain, accounting for about 60% of all rare earth mining globally, and, more importantly, over 90% of all processing. This rises to functionally 100% for specific rare earths, like gadolinium, which is used as a contrast agent in MRI scans to make images clearer, and terbium, which is used to create vibrant colours on smartphone and television screens. Now, this is in part because China is blessed with abundant reserves. According to the US Geological Survey, China possesses almost 50% of the world's mineable deposits, more than twice as many as second place Brazil, and about 20 times that of the US. This is why, in 1992, CCP leader Deng Xiaoping famously announced the Middle East has oil, China has rare earths. But China's dominance is actually mainly a consequence of the fact that, well, other countries are just unwilling to accept the environmental costs involved in processing, and China has conspicuously lax environmental regulations, at least in the relevant regions. The US actually used to dominate the global rare earth industry in the 1970s, but while mining in the US continued into the 2000s, the US began offshoring the processing bit to China in the late 1980s, because Americans didn't want to deal with the pollution. Now, at first glance, this might sound like a very solvable problem. Couldn't the US just relax its environmental regulations and start producing its own rare earths? Nor does it seem like this would be that expensive. The global rare earth market only runs to the tens of billions of dollars, which really isn't that much by American standards. 
But this story overlooks both a political and a technical obstacle. Politically, it's hard to see Americans tolerating the required amounts of pollution involved. Ordinary Americans just aren't that invested in the geopolitical competition with China, and are thus unlikely to accept, say, radioactive waste and toxic water to help rejuvenate America's rare earth industry. And technically, rare earth processing has moved on a lot since the US last did it in the 80s. It's now a multi-step process, and while the US could probably relearn most basic refining processes pretty quickly, China is the only country in the world that can do the most advanced refining. For instance, NVIDIA's most advanced semiconductors are made with something called ultra-pure dysprosium, which all comes from a single factory near Shanghai. Moreover, China's rare earth industry fits into a wider supply chain that runs up all the way from China's universities, which train thousands of engineers in rare earth refining every year, to the final products involving trace rare earths, like batteries, turbines, and robots. Now, to be clear, it's not impossible. The US could probably find some other country to help with the mining, which is presumably why Trump is so keen on mineral deals with countries like Ukraine and Greenland, and could eventually develop the technological know-how, which is presumably why, earlier this year, the Pentagon took a stake in MP Materials, a private American company focused on rare earths. Nonetheless, this would require sustained attention from Washington over a five or ten year time horizon, which feels unlikely at the moment. This could change if China overplays its hand, by stringently enforcing these restrictions and keeping them in place for a long time. But if these restrictions come and go, chances are everyone will just go back to relying on Chinese rare earths afterwards. This is what happened the last time everyone got stressed out about China's dominance in rare earths way back in 2010, when China apparently embargoed rare earths exports to Japan after a boat collision near the disputed Senkaku Islands. Prices spiked, the market reacted by temporarily increasing supply outside of China, but once the waters had calmed, everyone just started buying from China again. Because, well, they're the cheapest. Now, this story on China's rare earth restrictions is constantly changing and updating as more and more outlets are reporting on it. Right now, there are 229 sources currently reporting on it, with most of the coverage coming from the left. If we dive a bit deeper, we can see that the left focuses more on the disruptions to global supply chains, while right-leaning coverage depict these actions through aggressive lenses like chokehold and weaponize. This type of analysis is why ground news has been my favourite way to stay up to date with the news since 2023, so I want to thank them for sponsoring this video. It's no secret by this point just how much we're fans of ground news. They've been long-time supporters of this channel and independent news media at large. Their app and website makes it easier to navigate the news. Ground News gathers thousands of articles worldwide in one place, so you can easily compare how different outlets cover the same story. Each story comes with a visual breakdown of political bias, factuality, and who owns these sources. And it's not just me. Ground News has even been recognised by the Nobel Peace Centre for its impact on media literacy. And speaking of bias, their brilliant blind spot feed allows you to fully expand your media bias and find stories that are being disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum or the other. It's important to know the full story, and Ground News ensures you always will. If you're curious and committed to understanding what's really going on in the world, like us, Ground News is the tool you've been looking for, and that's why we've partnered with them to give TLDR viewers 40% off their unlimited access vantage plan. Subscribe to the link in the description, ground.news forward slash TLDR, or scan the QR code on screen. By subscribing, you're also supporting an independent news platform that's working to make the media landscape more transparent and balanced.